Hi, I'm Eugene, and today we're going to record a lunch series about runtime. And first question is, what is runtime? So runtime is a thing that runs everything on the blockchain. So let's say we have transactions coming in, and then we process transactions, and we get a result. So this is handled by runtime. Ignoring all the blockchain stuff, so what is the input and output is handled by the runtime. So let's start first with the account model. On runtime, we have accounts. So in the state, um, in a traditional blockchain like Ethereum or Bitcoin, accounts are represented by a public key. And this public key is an account ID. So what's a public key? So public key is just a unique cryptographical um, primitive that is known to everybody who wants to interact with your account. And it's part of the pair of public key and a private key. So private key is what you have. Public key is known to everybody you want to interact with. So on near uh, accounts are actually not keyed by the public key but they have a just unique username. So for example, my account ID can be um, Eugene. And this is what we call account ID. Within the account, we have a different type of fields. So account usually has a balance. And balance is, indicates the number of tokens the account holds. And tokens are measured in attenir. And attenir is 10 in minus 18 of a single near. We do this to keep the balance as an integer, so it's not a floating point. And attenir is uh, the smallest unit that we have for the token. Then on account, we also have log balance. And log balance is used for staking or indicating how much you wanted to stake or currently staked. Near is a proof of stake system. And stake is the log balance that is used by the validators. So if validators act properly, they earn more stake or more rewards. And if they act maliciously, they're going to lose their stake. So stake guarantees for validators to act properly. Also on account, on every account, we may have a contract. This is a code, a contract, a smart contract that can act on, on your behalf, on behalf of the account. So you said on every account we have a contract, but we might have a contract? What do you mean by that? Like, it might? Yeah, we might have it or might not have it. So by default, account doesn't have a contract, so it's empty. But it also can have a single piece of code that we call an account contract. So contract can have a state, and this state is a storage of the contract. So let's call it storage. And finally, um, to be able to access the account, we can have multiple access keys. So on a, again, on Ethereum or on a Bitcoin network, your public key and corresponding private key gives you access to the account. So by using a private key, you sign a transaction that guarantees that you are the owner of the account and you can act on behalf of this account. On near, we have multiple access keys, and they can have different permissions. So right now, on access keys, there's two types of permissions. First is full permission access key. It acts similarly to Ethereum. It gives full access to your account, so you can do all type of transactions. And second is a function call. 
and function calls is a specific access key that only grants permission for calling some other contract. It guards which account it can call and also how much tokens it can use to pay for the fees and which method it can call. So it can be very restrictive and we'll come back to this slightly later once we talk about transactions. So why we talk about accounts? Um, as you might know, NIR is sharded system. So we have multiple shards that both contain state and processing. So a single shard contains only some accounts of entire system. And let's say we have four shards and I'll draw them as blocks here. So this is four shards. And on every shard, we may have multiple accounts. So my account Eugene gonna belong to one of the shards. Um, Why wouldn't it be split up between all the shards? Like, isn't that how decentralization works? Uh, no. So every account belongs to exactly one shard, but how this is decided is not part of the account logic. So account doesn't control which shard it needs to belong. And this is controlled by the blockchain, which can rebalance accounts from shard to shard and actually make shards equal weight. So if some account is very heavy in terms of having a lot of storage or access key, this shard might have less other accounts compared to some other shard. Okay. So on near runtime, the way we actually process it, we always assume all accounts belong to the different shards. So even if we have two accounts, Eugene and Ashley, that belongs to the same shard, runtime will make an assumption they both belong, like they belong to the different shards. That is done, that collocation of accounts to the same shard doesn't give you any benefits. And that's why um, we don't want to developers or users to be thinking about um, collocating their accounts to get any benefit. This is done for two reasons. First, if you want to rebalance it, they, we don't break the any logic of the developer that used collocation. And second, it's also easier to design and think about this where you don't make an assumption that something is local. But what is always available for what we guarantee that if you interacting with the account, all this data that I mentioned, which is balance, log balance, contract, storage, and all access keys are all located on the same shard. And this is going to be important when we talked about transactions. So this account, do you have questions about accounts? No, let's move on to transactions. Cool. So let's talk about the life of the transaction. Standard simplest transaction on a Bitcoin chain is when one account transfers tokens from to another account. Uh, on near we call this transaction transfer. For clarity's sake, is this similar to like a bank transfer? Like yeah, it's just uh, like, or... exactly. Okay. So let's say, um, let's say Alice wants to transfer tokens to Bob and it's gonna be 100 at a year, which is small amount, but it's good for the example. So for this to happen, Alice needs to create a transaction. So transaction is contains the following fields, which are important. 
first, let's uh, erase account fields. Transaction uh, contains signer. Signer ID. This is the account ID that sends the transaction. In this case, it's Alice. Then it has a receiver ID. And this is the account ID that will receive a transaction. In this case, this is Bob. And then Transaction contains a list of actions. So this is another thing that is unique to near because um, you will talk about actions slightly later. In this case, transaction that Alice needs to do contains only a single action, and this is a transfer. So this transfer. contains a field indicating how much token or how many tokens Alice wants to transfer. So in this case, it's going to be 100. And this is a transaction. So now to indicate to the chain that this transaction is actually done by Alice and not someone else, Alice has to sign this transaction with one of the access keys which contains a private key. So Alice has to sign this transaction by computing a hash of this transaction. This gives you a unique field that she signs with um, private key and creates a signature. Transaction also contains some additional information that needed to make transaction unique, indicate which public key was used to sign, and stuff like this. So how does that tie into runtime? Right. So runtime actually receives a list of the transactions for every moment, and it processes this list of transactions. So transaction starts when Alice creates this transaction and then attaches a signature, and we call it signed transaction. So signed transaction can now be sent towards a blockchain that will verify the blockchain layer, going to verify that this transaction is valid, and put it into the chunk, which is piece of the shard, the next block of the shard. We call it chunks. Once signed transaction arrives to the chunk, this information is actually passed to the runtime. And runtime will process it and makes the necessary logic. And how fast is that? Uh, it depends on the blockchain layer. So the, we target to produce um, one block per second. And so this particular transfer will actually take about two seconds. And we'll get into this why it takes like longer than one second. So this is a signed transaction. We have it now, and let's say we want to process it. So let's say Alice account belongs to this shard, while Bob account belongs to the next shard. So they're on different shard. So how is uh, we can actually make it happen that tokens are transferred from one shard to another. Runtime, because the sharded system also works on shards. So on every shard, there are going to be a different instance of a runtime that will process uh, shards independently. This signature can only be validated by this given shard where account Alice exist. If a transaction lands on this shard, it cannot verify that Alice actually signed the transaction with proper key, because this shard doesn't have information, the shard of Bob doesn't have information 
about the account of Alice, so it cannot verify the validity of the transaction. That's why in a sharded system, we introduce um, a different type of transaction called receipt. And receipt is a process transaction that was created by the runtime itself. And receipt can actually be transferred cross shards through the blockchain layer and processed by the runtime on the other shard. So here's... Yeah. Just, I want to break this down in like really simple terms just so I understand it. Basically, you have your, your runtime and your TX, which is yeah. your... Okay, so that's your transfer. And so it's the equivalent of like putting your credit card in a machine, you sign it in person, and then something mumble jumbles up in, up in the internet, and then that's where the receipt comes from, and then it comes out and lets you know. Kind of similar? It kind of, yeah, let's do the analogy there. So you go to the store mm -hmm. and you have your credit card with a chip on it. Mm -hmm. So when you want to make a transfer and pay for the item, um, Visa sends you a request, let's say. Right. Your credit card locally through the chip signs this request. This is a signature that you created. Mm -hmm that goes back to Visa, it then can transfer from your account to um, a store account. And then the store gives you a receipt. And store gives the, store gets the money and then their transaction is actually from here confirmed. So internally they don't need to know that this has succeeded to transfer to store so long as the signature is verified by your account. So is that how it works for shards? We, we do it somewhat similar. Cool. So the life of this transaction is the following. We start with the shard of Alice. It received a signed transaction. It creates a receipt. that goes to shard of Bob. To prove that it was valid. And this receipt contains the amount that Alice transferred. So it contains 100 Atenier tokens that when receipt is applied here, Bob gets uh, plus 100 tokens. Cool. And that's how it works. But let's say just to step back, that Alice incorrectly entered Bob's account name and she put something like Bob is zero. So when it arrives to the shard where this account is supposed to be, um, since shard of Alice actually doesn't know that this account doesn't exist, it uh, redirects this to the new shard where it's supposed to be and this account doesn't exist, a receipt would fail and generate a refund. And refund is a receipt by itself. So it will generate a refund that will fly back to Alice and return this 100 tokens. So there's a fail safe in place? Yes. How does runtime tie into that? Cool. So now we can step back to the runtime and what it actually has every moment. So every moment it has, or every block that it produces, it has a list of signed uh, transactions and also a list of the incoming receipts. And these receipts are collected from all, all other shards towards the sh current shard. So in the previous block, we had another chunks. Um, and let's say they redirected something to Alice. So all this receipt is going to be there and all the new transaction that I also targeted going to be there. 
So what re re runtime does, it takes this input and produces the output, which is results. So this is what happened when we executed some receipts and maybe local transactions. If, for example, Alice does something on her own account. And also outgoing receipts. Uh, this is a new receipt that was generated by this process. So in this case, transfer is going to be Alice. It's a signed transaction. It will take tokens out of Alice account. So it's going to modify the Alice account, Alice account by removing the 100 tokens. Generate a new outgoing receipt that contains these 100 tokens that will go to the shard of Bob. Bob will receive this receipt and apply it and process it and generate the result and increase the balance of Bob account by 100 tokens. So this is how it works on a high level. And next time, we'll talk about function calls and contracts. Thank you.